I just uh, say a few words. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm a practicing medical doctor. I'm actually, I think, the only one here who actually sees patients every day. I, uh, my, <laughs> my, my practice is in uh, Seattle and Washington and the US. But I also uh, have a small practice in England. Um, and I'm also licensed in other countries, so I'm actually having real medical licenses in different countries and um, have quite a bit of an overview of, of medicine. I just wanted to let you know how I got into the light therapy. First of all, I had a, a teacher in school, in high school, um, who was a nuclear physicist. He was banned from working in the nuclear industry because of the post-war things, but he was a brilliant genius and his contribution was to find out how to use light to activate atoms to create a nuclear bomb, which is now used in every nuclear bomb. <laughs> but he introduced me to the physics of light uh, very early on. And in 1986, uh, together with Leona, who is back there, um, we took a workshop in color therapy with John Downing in California, who uh, had really kind of combined the tradition of all color therapies into a really almost scientific method of treating people. Um, I flew home from that meeting with an instrument called the Lumatron that was about the size of a washing machine, which at the time you could still travel with in the airplane, you know, just uh, go in. And uh, I was like maybe two or three weeks into having the instrument, I had a fairly large office, it was on a long corridor with many treatment rooms. It was when I still had the ego of, you know, needing like, I was running around like a whirling dervish from one room to another to treat people. And um, I, I had a patient, she was a very well-known psychic from Beverly Hills, um, who had MS, she was eight years in a wheelchair. And um, I had a little sort of convert the clothing cupboard where I put the instrument in because it needed to be a dark room. And I put her in there. I remember the, the color was indigo. The frequency of the flicker rate was uh, six. And I stuck her in there and, sort of, and I treated another patient in the next room. This is important for the story. On the other end of the corridor, about 20 meters away was the toilet. And um, about 15 minutes into the treatment, I was with another patient. There was a scream outside my door, like a really a bone-shattering scream. And I rushed out, and there was my patient standing there. This is a patient who hadn't walked in eight years. What she'd done, she was in the treatment. She needed to pee. She got off the wheelchair, walked down the 20 meters to the far bathroom, walked back, and only when she walked back, she realized that she had walked for the first time in eight years. <laughs> that was my introduction in color therapy. And you can imagine that it was for me, like as a physician who works mostly uh, with neurologically impaired patients, was a big breakthrough. I used the instrument on every patient and then very quickly got in trouble with the American FDA, who confiscated my instrument for several years and then released it when I had a better instrument by then. <laughs> um, but just to let you know, I, I come to this not lightly. In 1986 to now, there's quite a number of years that I've been in the field of light therapy. And I want to introduce you today, lead you into like a completely new use of color that I developed together with my friend Leona Vermeer, who's sitting there, um, where we can use light in a complete medical way, really substituting or replacing most medicines that people use in a specific way with using color instead of medicine. And I know um, eventually I will get in trouble with whatever health uh, uh, special interest group is present here uh, marketing pharmaceutical drugs. There's always some one or two spies in the audiences like this. So um, I mean, you're welcome to stay. but. Um, <laughs> Don't take it personal, what, what I want to say. Um, I want to take you, uh, I know yesterday you had a, a, a talk on biophoton theory and all that. I have, at the beginning, I have, I'm going to repeat some of that because it goes into the work that we actually are doing to, for the deeper understanding of it. So uh, biophoton therapy 
a theory of ultraweak light emissions guide growth and development of all living organisms. That's, these are just a couple of statements from my work with Dr. Pop. He and I used to be quite acquainted with each other and when he was in his fit years. Um, uh, this photon radiation facilitates interactive communication between different organisms and between cells and subsystems of the same organism. So, uh, you know, some of you, I don't know if you've seen this thing. I, I would love to have a laser pointer here. Hang on. Let me see if it works. Yeah. Okay, so. I'm not going to uh, go into the pictures, but you see here like a, a sprout and then uh, photographed by Pop with his biophoton camera. You see this picture is just the light emissions that the sprout gives off. Um, this is from Schlebusch, a common friend of Renzo and I. Uh, what he did, he put some acupuncture needles in the stomach meridian on the <coughs> left side of the patient and what you see is a lighting up of the stomach meridian on the right side. And this, of course, is photographed about three meters away from the patient. And that means that light emitted here travels three meters to where the camera is. And it's obviously infrared light, because that's where the camera works. And so that means this organism stimulated by the needle stick gives off light uh, in a very specific way. This is uh, from Pop's research. Um, basically what he did, he uh, radiated a, a wheat grain uh, with white light um, that was done here, from here to here. And then over the next uh, 30 seconds, you see the wheat grain giving off light. That means living uh, plants are able to store light and give light off, which is an important thing to know. This is... Uh, if a, a grain is poisoned, they used to poison gas in, in this one. And so what you see uh, here is the time when the grain was poisoned with something. And as a response of that, the grain gives off light. And then as it dies, it gives off light. And then gradually over time, the light emissions cease. I was uh, working in Paris, I studied psychology after medicine and worked uh, with Professor Bender in Freiburg. And he was able with a, a far infrared camera to film a dying patient. And what you saw as the patient was dying, you saw this light body of light lifting out of the patient, condensing to a ball, hanging in the room for actually two days, and then disappeared. So. That's the equivalent of this. Um, and this is a reversible poisoning. So again, a piece of grain giving um, a, a poison. As a response to that, it gives off its light and then realizes over time, well, I didn't die, actually, and contracts its light again and stops giving off light. But for you able to know that when we die, we give off a body of light that slowly disappears and um, separates from our physical body and moves off. A few things you need to know. Photons are information carriers. The important number here, one single photon can carry more information than is contained in all the libraries in the world. This is uh, Professor Pop's statistics. One single photon is able to virtually store an infinite number of bits of information. Uh, photons are utilized uh, for cell-to-cell -cell communication. I already said that um, the uh, biophotons are in a coherent state. And uh, the interesting thing is when two cells are next to each other, the signal to each other with photons, and I will show that in a moment, uh, the physics of that and the wavelength of one or the pattern of wavelength is mirrored by the other cell, but exactly a mirror image. And so when you have two photons that are a mirror image of each other and you stick a photo sensor in there, what you get is nothing. And I'll show that in, in a moment, it's called destructive interference. And so what is important for me that you know a little bit that the biophoton field 
utilizes every aspect of physics that life has access to. It uses standing waves, polarized light, we heard that a little bit on the last lecture, uh, constructive and destructive interferences, phase shifts and phase modulation, amplitude and frequency modulation, you know this one from our radio technologies, and squeezed light. Squeezed light is a physical property. When you look at a photon, you can either localize it in time, this is whatever, uh, 11.45 and so many seconds and so many nanoseconds right now, if you localize this in time, this photon is in contact with infinite time and if you localize it, sorry, it's, it's in contact with infinite space and if you localize it in space, the photon is right here, it is in that moment in contact with infinite time, all the future and all the past. And it explains for us, like in the psychological work that I do, that it is so easy for us to access past lives, prior lives, prior existences, and other, other realities, but how we can also mentally, you know, close our eyes and we can go uh, home, you know, and check home, you know, sort of, you, you can visualize your bedroom and your, your plants at home and your dog is probably sitting on the door waiting for you. Um, and uh, we can do that in real time and real space. That means we can access real information that's far away because of the property of our photons. Um, I, I wrote a lengthy uh, physics um, extraction from all the books on biophoton physics in, my, uh, in one of my books that in German. It's called Lehrbuch der Mental. Uh, Feld therapy, it's not the INK Verlag, it's VAK is the, the publisher. Okay, a few more things from POP in every cell. There are over 100,000 biochemical reactions per second regulated by a large number of metabolic enzymes. And so biology has always looked at how is, how is that all regulated because these things must be carefully sequenced, you know, one product. One enzyme creates product A, and then product A is needed for the next step to create product B times 100,000 per second. And can that be the intelligence provided for that? Can that be done through the chemistry itself? It would take months if the chemicals themselves would regulate this process. And then say, well, it must be electric. Maybe the inference of the autonomic nervous system and the electric fields generated are creating that intelligent sequencing that would still take days for the reaction to take place. It needs to be at the speed of light. And the only thing that can regulate that concert, that dance in our cell, is the biofield, the biophoton field itself. And so, um, so I just read you the sentence. This incredibly complex, interactive, complicated, and fantastic concept is orchestrated and regulated by the by photon field. Okay, and the information transfer piggyback on the biophoton beam is bidirectional. With the speed of light, every cell is informed what's going on in every other cell of the body. I want to explain that. Yeah, so we have <laughs> a couple of trillion cells that emit light, and that light creates a field outside the body, and every photon that comes out intersects with every other photon that leaves the body elsewhere. And piggyback on its own beam, it sends the information back of what it is learning on the way out. <laughs> and through that, the, uh, the information transfer is bidirectional. You have, uh, the cell sends out this beam that carries with it the information which genes are turned on, which ones are turned off, the epigenomic regulation of the genes, and a whole bunch of more information comes out. And as it travels out, it meets all the other photons from every other of the trillions of cells and sends that information back. And that makes it possible for any higher organism to function. That at the speed of light, every cell in the body knows what is going on with every other cell of the body. When we do light therapy by beaming light at the body, we, we're interfering with that field and we're we are piggybacking on that already rich information exchange. We are adding 
information into it. Yeah, this is a dinsha type of color therapy. When we put color in the field or information in the field, as you will see later, what we do now is much more complex and sophisticated than that. Now, uh, many of our subsystems, it's a question then, okay, how, how does the light come out of the body and how does it go in? Well, we have many subsystems in the body that are light conducting. The first order of it is the water in the matrix in our body, the fascia are light conductive, the tubulin, which is the main player here, the collagen is light conductive. Um, the tubulin scaffolding, that is most known inside the nerves and inside the cells, is present in all tissues of the body and an all-connected fiber optic light network. Um, I wrote an article in the Journal of the College of Syntonic Optometry many, many moons ago where I uh, proposed that there are five pathways that light takes when you put light in the eyes. And there is the sixth pathway which is this, that the tubulin inside the nerves, the optic nerve, but also the tubulin inside the nerve endings that are everywhere on the skin is actually a light receptor and a light conductor and it conducts the light to every cell in the body. The tubulin network, I'll show you just an example of that, is an all connected network that has no beginning and no end. Um, so here's a little bit on the tubulin. This is a nerve. What you see here is a myelin sheath. But these yellow strands in here, that's tubulin. And tubulin doesn't stay confined. So the nerve, you know, the, the thing that we learn in medical school is the nerve conduction happens outside the nerve. Electric fields wandering outside the nerve for the propagation of nerve impulses as we know them. But what medicine has uh, lied to us about or deprived us of is this internal system where impulses and information travels at the speed of light in every nerve of the body and this tubulin actually exits in many places. It's not graphically uh, presented here but this tubulin actually exits in many places a nerve and creates a network of tubulin structures in the matrix and enters the cells and this is fairly little uh, published recently. Uh, it's only known since electron microscopy has been able to show that, that we are really, if, if I would strip your body of everything except the tubulin, we would still recognize each other. Yeah? That's how dense that is. Um, just a little bit on the matrix. Yeah, so here's the nerve with the tubulin inside. The nerve connects with the smooth uh, muscle of the vasculature. It connects with the cells of the immune system, the fibroblasts, and it connects with the cells and any impulse. Of course, the electric impulses I talked about reaches those uh, structures, but the tubulin here leaves this and actually joins the matrix molecules, it joins the collagen, it uh, joins the cell wall, and all these structures, when I put light on your body, if I shine laser light on your neck, which I do right now, that laser light will be detectable in every cell of your body, in every tissue of your body at the speed of light. This is fairly little known. A little bit about the connective tissue. Connective tissue is another light conductor. It's the fascia. Um, and just some samples of fascia here. Um, we did some of my own experiments in the laboratory in Seattle. Uh, hey, come back. Okay, so <laughs> what we did, we, we took some fascia, admittedly from an animal, not from a uh, human being, and we put a laser light into the fascia on one end, and on the <coughs> other end a light conductor that was 80 centimeters long, and we could very well demonstrate in a very, very simple experiment that all the fascia in the body is light conductive. It's like a fiber optic system. You can almost see it here, you know, that this is not muscle and it's not some strange tissue. It's a fiber optic system. And even the osteopaths here in the room don't know that. Yeah, you should know that. How many of you are osteopaths trained by Raphael here? Or so? One only, yeah, you should. Bring that information there. 
Okay, now what's important about the dance of this field? Well, to the outside, this field is in contact not only with the outside world, but also the invisible higher worlds. To the inside, this field is in contact with every tissue and fluid, every cell, every met metabolic enzyme, and every regulating protein. I skip some things because I'm aware of the time. Um, we have 23,688 genes. There's, by the way, just a few hundred more than the fruit fly. And it's almost 10,000 less than sweet corn. Yeah? So on the evolutionary scale, we are somewhere closer to the fruit fly than corn. <laughs> True story. You can read that up. Um, important for what's coming, we have two blueprints for every protein, one from your dad, one from your mom. Um, and it's the epigenetics that decide whether the lousy gene of your mom is selected or the good one from your dad. Yeah, we do a lot of work with genes. When you have an unhealed relationship with your dad, it's much more likely that your body transcribes the gene from your mom, even if it's the worst gene that gives you the migraines and gives you the, the osteoarthritis and all that. But you will prescribe that. And the moment you heal it with your dad, your epigenetic mechanism get a choice to actually pick the gene from your dad to be transcribed. That's a huge part of the work that we do uh, in our practice. Um, then another one, every protein can assume over 1,000 spherical shapes. Each shape makes it work differently. Every protein has light receptors. I'll show that in a moment. Depending which ones are stimulated, the protein folds differently. And, you know, and, and so a protein can you know, add uh, hydrogen to, to a, a product or take a hydrogen away. It can do it at high speed, at low speed. And what determines our health is that the things that are needed to adapt to our environment are done as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And it's the epigenetics that decide that, not the genetics. The genetics are way overvalued right now, um, and the epigenetics are still underrated. What's affecting the epigenetics um, is nutrition, physical activity, gravity, electromagnetic fields have right now a very devastating illness-producing effect on our epigenetics, um, toxins, poor dental occlusion, many other things. So here's what I want, here's like a metabolic enzyme, and each metabolic enzyme has these funny things, they call them loops, yeah, where actually the, uh, so a, a protein is a chain of amino acids, yeah, so Everything in color here is a different amino acid, and they're kind of hooked together like this. And every once in a while, they're sort of kissing here, they're, they're connected, and make this loop. And it's been found that each one of the loops on the proteins are very specific monochromatic light receptors. They're actually not exactly monochromatic. They act their light receptors in a bandwidth of 10 nanometers. And that's going to become important to what I say later. And this is known in biology, but the biologists that do not know about biophysics, they wonder why would we make these proteins that have light receptors inside the body where there is no light, right? That's, the, the, that's where physics is right now. I'm trying to lead you into, well, there very well is light in the body. And these proteins are all... Um, positioned on tubulin, yeah? So I, 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 maybe this thing comes together for you a little bit. And when I shine light on the body, the, the nerve endings are all rich in tubulin. Once one tubulin is stimulated, the light is conducted through the entire body. And all of our over 150,000 different metabolic enzymes are aligned and attached to tubulin on the tubulin scaffolding of our body. And so uh, for me, uh, putting one and one together, it's very clear that our whole system is a light network that where light is translated into action by these proteins, and this is sort of where the action of life really is. So there is some articles on this. I'm going to skip that. This is a little bit from Marco Bischoff, since Dr. Pop is not healthy enough anymore to lecture. Marco Bischoff has pretty much taken over 
And these are just some statements from this thing that pretty much uh, under underline what I've just said. The central, central storage facility and emitter of coherent biophoton radiation in the cell is a chromatin of the DNA. Um, Biophysics has proven that the spiral arrangement of the DNA makes it an ideal light storage facility. The DNA spiral contracts rhythmically several billion times per second and either gives up, gives off a photon every time it contracts or absorbs a photon. Yeah, so this is like, you know, like a slinky, do you know, guys know that? Yeah, like a, a coil that kind of does this movement. And every time it contracts, it squeezes out one single photon that carries the information of all the bits that are active in the DNA and the information of what's not active and the information what's crummy and unhealthy kind of goes out into the field and informs the rest of the body. And what is worrisome is this number, several billion times per second. Why is this worrisome? Any, anybody knows what the carrier frequency of the Wi-Fi is? It's 2.4 billion times per second. So the Wi-Fi, the way we are using it right now, is directly interfering with this process. And it's most, the most devastating health compromising uh, technology that we are right now all subject to. OK, through light emissions, the DNA in the organism is a well-connected network on the primary intelligence intelligence in our biophoton field. The DNA initiates, guides, and controls our light metabolism. The DNA works closely together with a hierarchy of other light active molecules. Together they form the network of the light metabolism. Okay, and there's Peter Garayev and others that have written up on this. Um, this is just Marco Bischoff's words that I just used here the last few pages. So, um, his book um, was in the Falak 2000. Yeah, uh, I forgot what was it, the title in German. Anyway, you should Google his book that came out in the mid 1990s. He it's was a uh, Marco was the president of the ILA. We were very familiar yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're trying to get his book translated in English. It has to be, yeah. It has to be because it is still current. Yeah, it used to be futuristic when he wrote it. Now it's absolutely current. Yeah, every biophysicist knows uh, knows the work. Okay, but what's important ultimately, the <coughs> light in the nucleus of the cells comes from the sun. It enters our system via the skin, eyes, breath, and nutrition. Yeah, when we take nutritional supplements, like most of us English-speaking do people do, the Germans don't and the Austrians don't, because uh, they still have some biophotons in their nutrition. But we certainly in America. Our food is dead, has died a long time ago, and that means there is no more light uh, emissions. Yeah, the, the light can be stored in food. Yeah? With the, the leaf you know, that takes in the sun and makes chlorophyll, it's a light storage container, and then we eat it. It gives off the light back in our body. But uh, Pop showed already at his heyday that, uh, for example, the genetically modified food cannot give off light. Yeah, and, and he did this beautiful study for the German government where he showed that GMO food is dead. And then the representative of the government received his work um, and then put it in a shelf. And she was dismissed from her job a week later. Yeah, she was let go of the government. So that's how the German government handled the GMO issue. And now you know, GMO food is coming now. Uh, the light absorption of the retina, skin, and tissue is regulated by the biophoton field. We absorb the sunlight primarily. Uh, we absorb the coherent aspects of it. Remember the squeezed light and the modulated light. Um, we have many light conductive structures and subsystems in the body. Yeah, mainly for me, it's the fascia and the tubulin. And they conduct the sunlight and the light from other organisms in the environment to the nucleus of each cell. Um, okay, I think most research, again, uh, these are Bishop's work, is the microtubulin, the microscopic hollow cylinders that connect the skin, the nerves, and the matrix with each cell. They contact and activate cell wall receptors, 
penetrate the cell wall and guide the light to the DNA inside the nucleus. For example, the enzymes of the citric acid cycle in the mitochondria yeah, are sitting on the tubulin cytoskeleton and are intimately in contact with the information flowing through it. This is something that um, comes from biology. Medical doctors do not learn this. Yeah? Physicists don't learn that. Biophysicists don't learn that. You have to kind of string the different areas of research together to come up with this. And I, I do believe that Marco Bishop is still the only person out in the field that can actually put this in a language that we can understand. Okay, just to, I'm, I'm not, not going to bore you too much with it. Then I get to the interesting part. Um, so light, you know, when it has a higher amplitude, the wavelength that's a stronger light, more visible. This is a weaker light. Um, then there is a wavelength, the shorter wavelength and light that's on the blue end of the spectrum, the longer wavelengths are on the red end of the spectrum. Um, and this is what I mentioned uh, before. Now, if you have two photons traveling together, they can each be in phase. That means, you know, they're traveling this way, and so the peak, the belly of this wavelength coincides in time with this one and then they create a combined wave that is very strong. What is important for our healing work is this one, the destructive interference. If I have a substance that emits this light and have a substance that has the same wavelength but a phase shift of 180 degrees, that's called where the belly of this wave coincides with the valley of this one, what you get is this one. When two cells are next to each other over time, this, the cell number one will emit this wavelength and the other one gets in a coherent state with it and emits this one coming the other way. And then when they both coincide, you get this between the cells. And so researchers were for 60 years fooled by this, where they said, well, we can, if you take a single cell we can measure light emissions. But if you put two cells in a real living system, there is no light. <laughs> yeah? Because they're stuck a light measuring diode into the space between the cells, and then I find this, which is nothing. It looks like nothing, but it's really the interference of two living wavelengths of light. I translate that when we, I, I use a lot of muscle testing in my work. Uh, a system called autonomic response testing. And when we have a, a problem in a patient, for example, mercury toxicity, it may create this wavelength. And then in the muscle testing, what we're looking for is the substance that gives this the same wavelength, but a phase shift of 180 degrees. That would be the healing remedy, because it neutralizes the illness-producing effect <coughs> of this, and we get that. You know? That's when in muscle testing, we put on, let's say, mercury, the patient goes in a stress state, and then we put on chlorella or cilantro, one of the healing things, and the muscle testing goes back to neutral. We have this, or at least an aspect of that. Then there's polarization. Yeah? So polarization was freely used by my previous speaker here. So um, light, always a single photon moves in one plane. It doesn't kind of move randomly through the space. It moves like a rope that you swing, and then you can swing the rope. Each photon can move in every plane it wants to. And when you use a polarization filter, it works like this, yeah, like a, a grid. And then the only wave when you swing this rope that will go through is you swing it in exactly that, that thing. So if you use a linear polarization filter, which you will see in a moment me doing, um, what we're looking for, um, replacing this uh, a pulse filter, a polarization filter on the patient, and see how the light is coming out of the patient. We can measure that in very simple ways. And polarization, remember, is one aspect of coherent light. And it's the easiest one to measure and the easiest one to produce. We don't know yet how to produce squeezed light. So in my work, we use a polarization filter. Here's just a couple of um, pictures. Pop showed that very clearly with this measurement that the body, the healthy body, it emits light in polarized planes. It means the light doesn't come out chaotically out of my body. It comes out in parallel planes. If I'm looking at my frontal planes like that, I could 
put the pe piece of paper here and draw waves on there, and that's pretty much how they will travel. They all come out parallel to each other, but that's <coughs> only true if I'm healthy. The moment an organ or tissue gets ill or traumatized, that uh, phenomenon stops. This is uh, a drawing from Babbitt. Babbitt was the first uh, reported light therapist. He was a surgeon uh, in the Civil War, the cruel, horrible Civil War in the U.S. in the, 19, uh, in the 18, eight, uh, 1860s, um, where millions of people died of horrible injuries. And what he was able to do, shine light, you know, people lost a lot of limbs, and then they had the phantom limb pain, and he was able to figure out, he, he had vision, he could see the energy field of people, and he, he could determine exactly what type of color to shine on there. There was really before electricity, so he used petroleum lamps and put a color screen in front of it and shined it onto uh, the, the injuries and had incredible reported healing results that were reported in those days in the medical journals. That's Babbitt, and that's one of his drawings, how he perceived the human energy field or the light, the, not the energy field, but the, the actual light emissions, how they organize themselves around the body. And this is Alex Gray. But you always see that longitudinal representation where anybody who has a bit of vision uh, can see that. So now we get a little bit to that part of, of my talk. To treat a client, we need to know which tissues have lost their coherence, the ability to organize <laughs> light, why did they lose their coherence, and what is needed to reestablish the coherent state as necessary precondition to heal. Yeah, so what, what is the medication that we need? Um, so we work with the pull filter. You know, if you put two linear pull filters, um, 90 degrees against each other, you get this. Yeah, there's no more light going through, you know, because if one photon goes this way and the other one goes the other way, um, it blocks the light. So I want to just show briefly, let me see, let me do it, just a tiny demonstration. Yeah, ailing organs or body compartments lose the ability to polarize light and to organize the light emissions in a way that they're able to be used for communication and orchestrating all body functions. At the onset of pathology, the axis of light emission changes either clock or counterclockwise, and then if pathology progresses, the ability to polarize light is lost altogether. The more chaotic the light emissions, the sicker the body region is. Okay, now here comes before the demo, the last thing. If the linear polarization filter is placed axially on the healthy body, the entire system instantly changes from its previous state to a relaxation state. And in muscle testing, it means a strong indicator muscle becomes weak. If an organ or body area has lost its ability to polarize light, either from trauma, toxicity, infection, or illness, there is no state change of the system. Okay, comes to? Yeah, so we do, we do a quick, we just need the pull filter. Yeah. We, do, we just need a volunteer, maybe somebody from the early rows here, so it's kind of easy. Volunteer, please. Okay, why don't you come, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, the test looks incredibly <coughs> stupid, infantile, and simple, but um, I've been, you know, elected physician of the year worldwide several times, you know, using that system. None of my peers in the universities have achieved that status, you know, <laughs> but me, being a single practitioner in a little boxed office, have achieved that status more than once. So, yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. So, I have a filter, it's got that grid on it, and the normal, I, I show it on Ulrike, I place the grid on any body part in the correct alignment, it does that. And if I turn it 90 degrees, nothing happens. Yeah? And uh, so I can find any tissue that is normal. Now, she's been treated a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there. Uh, 
Now we get a test over the lung on both sides. Do you mind turning around? We can scan the, the spine. Yeah, in the low back, we're also getting a problem. And I can twist the thing and see how much of a problem. Well, she's twisted <laughs> about 30 degrees or so, you know, on, on the low back. Now, no, come back. Would you mind getting the other one? That's the other one. Yeah. So we just don't want to let her hang like this. Okay, head, head, Susie. Yeah. I'm just put that against your chest or so. Would you mind? Yeah, and just hold this against the chest. We just do a quick, a quick and dirty. Yeah, and that resolves her, her lung issue. It's aluminum. I talk at the end of my talk, if I get the time, why most of you will have aluminum on your lung. Thank you very much. That was all. Yeah. Yeah. So a polarization, the ability of a tissue to polarize light and organize is one of the aspects uh, that we're using to see if the body in that part is in a coherent state or not. And then we can figure out very quickly what's needed to bring it back to the coherent state. And after like 40 years of doing this, I got some ideas of what the quickest way is to get there. Good. Um, then we use a thing called signal enhancer. Um, a signal enhancer is a plastic material that has a perfect crystalline organization of the plastic molecules in it. And it's sort of like, uh, say, like a perfect crystal. And if we're placing, uh, this thing looks like this. If you place that next to the patient and put a product on there, for example, like uh, I don't know, a B vitamin, then the body will immediately behave as if it's eaten that. Yeah. It's not like the old kinesiology where you put things in the hand or put them on the body. You put that next to the body. Uh, and the size of this is very important. We did the math on it. It has to be exactly that size. And then whatever you put on there, the body behaves as if it's eaten exactly that amount. Yeah, that has moved as light years ahead of uh, many other schools of energetic testing, but it's going to become important at the end. Okay, now I get to what I really wanted to share with you, the photophoresis. Yeah? Light, um, I may start here on the other end. The uh, precursors to this that I was privileged to have the, follow the development in my own practice. So first issue was iontophoresis, you know, you place an electrode in the front of the shoulder, one in the back. You put a steroid cream underneath, and the active part of the steroid cream is negatively charged, and so you put that under the negative electrode, and the negative electrode will push the negatively charged particles deep into the tissue instead of injecting it. That was called iontophoresis. Then it evolved that you could do the same thing with ultrasound, and that was called phonophoresis. And then it was really me and maybe a couple of other people that I don't know of realized we can do the same thing with light. Yeah? Initially, we used infrared light. We had a Swiss manufacturer for some lasers, and we used to piggyback on the laser beam the medication. And we could show that we could, instead of injecting steroids, we could put it in a little same material, a little device next to the laser beam, and push the medicine that way into the laser beam. And so. However, this thing has evolved. This is like now maybe 25 years ago we were there. And so uh, light can be used as a carrier of information and healing frequency to achieve a, cha a state change in the treated organism. So this is not just using light and color, but as you will see, we piggyback on the color the remedy that we want to give the patient. This is a new idea. It's not really new but it's a really new idea that is not in ELA not known yet, and is not known yet. The College of Syntonic Optometry um, wasn't particularly interested in me after I introduced it to them. So why that is? Uh, because we 
moving now into a medical area where the licensing issue suddenly becomes an issue. Are we allowed to use this or not? Well, I will show you what phenomenal things we can do with that. Light can also be used to teleport not only information but actual medicine into a living system without giving the medicine in physical form. We can, instead of giving somebody a vitamin B12 shot, we can use light in a specific way to piggyback the B12 onto the light beam, shine it into the eyes of the patient, and the patient's lab values will change as if they've gotten a vitamin B12 shot. And I want to take you there all the way in the next few minutes that I got left. <laughs> Um, so, a little bit on the literature, yeah, to show that I'm not just talking. Yeah, this is an article from Nature, one of the highest ranked scientific journals from 2013. Quantum teleportation of photonic quantum bits by hybrid technique. What they're basically doing here in a very sophisticated write-up is what I will show you at the end is so dead simple and interesting enough, Leona, who is even older than me, was the only person in the entire universe that understood that. The first time I lectured about it and ran with it and developed a technology that makes this working. By the way, I have no financial interest in any instruments or anything that kind of I will be talking about, even though I used her instrument after testing, after spending about $80,000 in all the instruments that were out there, and there was one that actually worked for doing this. So, but no financial interest, okay? That makes my talk a little different from some of the other talks that you will be hearing. Um, quantum teleportation of laser-generated photons with an entangled light-emitting diode. Now, long and easy, an instrument that I developed is this one here. I don't know if you can see it. Mm, it's, mm. Anyway, this is, a, this is a laser that breaks the laser light into a line. And maybe it's safe. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, you, I don't. Oh yeah, uh, this, this one is nicer to see. So this laser, this article basically translated into this. All I have to do is put one of my signal enhancers, the one I just showed you in front of this, put a medicine on it, and that medicine will be teleported into the patient. That's what... Um, what I do have to say is that the instrument that I'm going to mention later, the photon wave, where we use color, has a more profound effect. Yeah? This one takes longer, and it doesn't go as deep. But when you read this article, Nature Communication is associated with uh, the journal Nature. Um, when you read the whole article and talk to the scientists, that's what they actually did. Yeah? And that's a simple way of making life work. Um, so here another article from Nature from 2004, a little earlier. Quantum teleportation provides a means to transport quantum information efficiently from one location to another. Well, okay, yeah, we can piggyback information, for example, a homeopathic, onto the laser beam or onto the light beam and transport it into the turbulent system of the patient so that information is instantly everywhere. When you take a homeopathic, you have to rely on the blood flow of the patient and the lymphatics you know, to slowly carry the information through the system. If you use light, it's at the speed of light in every cell of the body. It's a very, very different ball game. And the best thing is you never use up any medication. You can, with one vial, you can treat all 7 billion people on the planet <laughs> for the rest of your life. I'm not joking. Um, quantum teleportation between light and matter. It just shows that you can piggyback um, a substance on the light beam and matter will change yeah, accordingly. Okay, I'm going to skip. Let me see what the time is. So I've got about 20 minutes left according to my, to my... 
Okay, uh, Luc Montagnier was a big influence on me. You know, he's a guy who invented the AIDS virus, whether it exists or not. Uh, um, and he's one of the top virologists in the world. And he did this beautiful experiment. I'm just going to go forward to this one. So what he did was this. He took a, a coil and pulsed an electric current through it at 7 hertz. And he put two vials in there. He put tube number one that had the AIDS virus in it and tube number two, they were all closed with sterile water and then used the PCR test, the one that we use to detect viruses, and just exposed this for a couple of minutes, for 18 hours, sorry, for 18 hours he let this run and after 18 hours he found live viral particles in the sterile water, yeah, as an example of teleportation. I talked to him, I called him, I said, look, what did you do? He said, well, you know, really my first experiment was much better, where he took a uh, $20 purple laser that you can buy on Amazon. And he did the same experiment, taking two glasses and shining a laser to one glass that had a viral culture in it into the other glass that just had sterile water in it, and he found the DNA there. He wanted to publish it, and there wasn't a single peer reviewer in the entire world that could make a statement to it. He couldn't get it published. But the peer reviewer says, could you step that down to the electromagnetic levels? Then we will approve it and publish it. Yeah? So that experiment was never published. But for me, it was, hey, we can piggyback stuff on the laser beam and teleport it into this thing. How about doing that with a hormone or a vitamin or a neurotransmitter? Yeah? And so I want to show you, take you there what we do with that. So, for this photophoresis, as I call it, there is the photon wave, which is the instrument that I use to do all this. There is Dinshaw's external skin irradiation with colored light that works, but it's often too slow for my uh, taste and for my patients. I'm in America, everything used to be now. Uh, and then there's the laser photophoresis, which I just showed you. And so, a little bit on the photon wave instrument, um, it's basically a slide projector um, that, proje that gets to choose. I show that here like between uh, 64 different colors, but there is a unique setup inside this instrument that I like to explain. It's got a halogen light bulb, and then through a mirror system, the light is guided two ways, where the pathway for one aspect of this is slightly longer than the other. That's the principle of creating holographic images. You use the same light, one shines directly out, one is delayed in time, so it's a phase shift of the same light comes through the lens. And that creates a completely different healing tool than any of the other color machines. And this is the only machine where we were able to do prove the teleportation, and I'll show that in a moment with some of the proofs that we have. Um, so, there's a number of things that uh, you can discuss. You know, if you go to the booth of Leona, she will take you through this, but the, the color lenses have a bandwidth of exactly 10 nanometers. If you remember my earlier part of the talk, that was very, very important. And the flash rate that can be used is one between 1 and 35 hertz. Uh, there's different color combinations you can do with it. Um, Metatron, the pharmacy here in Vienna, has developed a color kit that you can test the different colors basically by irradiation, by irradiating water with the color, with that frequency for a certain number of time, you imprint that color into the water and then if that's put in a brown bottle, it stays there for good and you can use that if you use muscle testing or other energetic testing, you can test the exact color and the frequency that you need to use. So now comes the thing that Leona asked me not to disclose. but it is an important part. So how do we piggyback vitamin B12 onto the light beam? So there is a, that same plastic material that I mentioned before is formed into a plate. The plate is in front of the lens. This is what the patient sees. They're looking at this lens that flashes the light at you. And in contact with the plate are the vials, ideally liquids, 
of the medication that we want to teleport into the patient. And then the treatment rarely runs over eight or nine minutes. And rarely is done more than twice a week. And for most purposes, and I will show that, a total of six treatments are needed to completely transform the patient. If you're dealing with a toxin, yeah, for example, mercury, I don't want to teleport mercury in the patient. I, um, I developed, that was a bit of an intuitive hit that I got by actually putting a hole in the plate and putting the, the vials with the toxin there. The hole in the plate creates a phase shift of 180 degrees. I learned that from my nuclear physicist math teacher. Yeah, when you put a hole in there and the light shines through it, it creates exactly that phase shift. So the toxin becomes its perfect antitoxin. And what we do with the photon wave, we do almost all the detoxification of patients that way. We diagnose with muscle testing, whether you're toxic with glyphosate, aluminum, mercury, lead, or any other thing, all we need is a sample of the toxin. We put it there. There is a program. The wonderful thing with this instrument is got somebody's figured out the colors and frequencies and the sequencing of it, and you just push a button. The patient sits there for eight minutes, and it completely neutralizes that particular toxin in the patient. It's a phenomenal, simple, stupid program. So. Here is for an example of the detox, but there's many programs in there. Um, the, the detox program, so it's two minutes yellow plus green that mobilizes the toxins, and four minutes of turquoise and blue, and two minutes of indigo uh, and indigo, so double indigo. But remember, it has a funny phase shift in it by the light source being split and reunited with the phase shift in itself. Okay, how do we proceed? There is the detox program. Uh, we do heavy metals and vaccines with that one as the main one. After a week, we do the candida program for most of molds and fungi. And the last one is the allergies plus parasites program. That's not so important for me because you can learn that. Um, so i am get to the more exciting part now. Yeah, the combination of body and field diagnosis, which we do with our muscle testing, and the subsequent photophoresis with appropriate carriers of information or substance called the KLM method, Klinghardt light modulation, not only leads often to dramatic symptomatic improvement, but also to positive changes in objective parameters, labs and imaging studies, immune parameters, electrophysiological parameters, thermography, all the way to epigenetic and genetic changes. And I want to show you that now. So here's the a patient, she was a former nurse, became psychotic. We did a test for her for uh, mercury. Um, and she had a you know, decent mercury level coming out of her. Instead of choosing the normal detox things that I did in those days, we tried out Leona's program. And so after uh, six photo wave sessions, she had no more hallucinations. The mercury level was significantly down here you know, from 18 to 5.8. And then um, a few, this is, uh, you know, this was, when was it? That was November 2006. This is uh, April 2007. It's the American way of putting the numbers up there. Uh, and then uh, a few months later, uh, this is another five months later, she was healthy, back to work, further reduction in mercury with three more light sessions. This is what you will see when you work that way. It's a beautiful way, instead of injecting DMPS and EDTA and doing all the things that I also do in my practice, because my patients come to me not because they want light. They're, they're Americans. You know, they want chemistry, real medicine. OK, here's a little statistics I did um, years ago uh, by doing six light sessions of this sort. You know, they'd be individualized. but uh, this people self-rated on you know, the scale just from zero to four, how bad they were. So here's the three top ones, sleep disorder, depression, anxiety, fatigue. And so it went from an average of 3.5 to an average of two after six sessions. Two was rated, I can live with this, I still have some discomfort, 
but I can live with this. Yeah, and this is, uh, I, I uh, honestly forgot it was 60 or 80 patients. It was a lot of them. Um, okay, now I get to more to the juicy bit of this. So this is another experiment we did in the practice. 20 chronically ill patients. There were 12 men, 8 women. Uh, the mean age was 46.3 years. We observed them for six months, and they had an average of 6.4 treatments with the light modulation. And what we did, we tested just the cofactors of the methylation cycle, as vitamin B1, B2, B6, B12, uh, folic acid, folinic acid, <coughs> methylated folic acid, and a few others, glycine, dimethylglycine, trimethylglycine. We have a test kit. In my, my group here, the, the Klinghardt team in Austria has a test kit for that. So that's what we did. But we did give them some medication, so it couldn't be published because it wasn't pure, because I was doing one other variable, I was giving them chlorella as a binder. So when you mobilize stuff, it circulates through the blood, and the body needs to shove it out. We want to make that easy for the body to bind it up in the gut. And so here is what we saw. Remember, six treatments with light. This is the level of methylated folate in the serum. And you see this nice sort of progression over six months, a dramatic improvement. There was still short, this is, uh, I forgot to say, these were all autistic uh, people, um, teenagers and adults with autism. And so we saw the numbers beautifully climbing up. Um, this is mental clarity measured um, you know, as a byproduct of the treatment. And this is the uh, amount of sleep uh, people were getting. Good. And now a little bit on genetics. So there was something that surprised me. This was a, a patient with repeated fractures who couldn't create any bone density. We did the genetics and it showed the vitamin D receptor. This is the genetic test. You have one gene from mom, one from dad. Yeah, and it showed whenever uh, there is a plus plus, that means they're bad genes. Yeah, and that's the good ones are the minus ones. But I just want to focus on this one. So it had from one parent a bad gene, from one a good one. And it was very clear from the history that the bad one was transcribed, it was used. And so um, this is November. And this is February the next year, so three months later, we get this. We have a true genetic change. And what we did is the photon wave and a little bit of my PK work yeah, without giving anything. Surprised me. Yeah, I thought maybe a lab mistake. And so some of my rich patients I asked you know, after treatment whether they would be willing to have that test redone because it's expensive. And then we had this one here. This was a, a woman with extreme uh, chemical sensitivity. You know, and this gene up here, plus plus COMT, catechol O methyl transferase, that's the gene that's responsible for the enzyme that breaks down your neurotransmitters. You, know, you, you all know, like some of you, you get angry about something, and then you should your anger should kind of dive down after a few minutes when the danger is over. But some of you are still ranting and raving three days later. That's that enzyme has the job of breaking those neurotransmitters down yeah, that you don't need anymore. And so she was chemically sensitive. That means the moment she was exposed to some mold or something, she was sick for like three weeks. And so we treated her the same way, light therapy plus the uh, PK work. And then we got this. Let's look at the time from March to July true change in the genes. It's not possible. Yeah? It's not doesn't happen. You can't do that. Klinghardt, yeah? It must be a lab mistake. So we did look a little bit more. Uh, here's a patient who was a chronic fatigue patient that couldn't detox. And uh, what you see here is the gene, the glutathione S transferase. It's the, the gene that restores uh, glutathione, one of the principal detox agents in our cells. And again, she, these are two locations. Your genes have, on the genome, they have house numbers, like street numbers, like you have here. Yeah. And so this gene is there twice. There's a house number here and one here. And you see that one for mom or dad was bad, one was good. 
and from the fact that she couldn't detox, it was clear that she had a problem, and so she volunteered. And this is just a month later. You know, she had three sessions. We see uh, one of the genes has obviously repaired itself. I know it's not possible, yeah, but what do we do? Um, now, uh, at the end, I just want to give you just a tiny bit more of something that worries me. Uh, Fritz Holwig, some of you know his, his work. He was a brilliant surgeon that was before uh, lenses could be implanted. He did brilliant, sophisticated surgery on people that had cataracts. You know, when you have a cataract, your body doesn't get as much light through the retina, uh, th through the eye, as healthy people. And he did the brilliant work by taking lab work of people that were clinically blind because they were so gray that they couldn't see anymore and found uh, that mostly their neurotransmitters and hormones were all totally in the basement of where they should be. So people had no adrenal hormones, they were fatigued, um, they had no joy in life, they had no sex hormones, they had no libido, nothing. Then he restored one eye back to vision and he saw that the abnormal values came up halfway to normal. And then he restored both eyes and they came both back <coughs> to normal. Now, what worries me today we see exactly the same changes, but in the entire population. My patients all have low adrenal hormones, they have low progesterone, low testosterone, low DHEA, you know, all the same things Holwig looked at, we see now in the general population that has healthy eyes. So I was inquiring, why could that be? How could that have to do with light? Now, I'm older than most of you here, and I remember a time when the skies were blue, when they were blue. And they were gray when they were gray. Now they're gray when they're blue, <laughs> and they're gray, really gray when they're gray, and a really blue day is very rare. And so, the end of my presentation, I cannot talk about light without talking about this. The geoengineering to control the runaway climate um, you know, the, when you look at the planes and uh, this happens, and then when you f stay there without walking away or looking away, within a few hours, this spreads out and the entire sky gets gray. Is it normal? Maybe it's just a normal effect from the planes. Um, we know what is being sprayed is mostly aluminum. Uh, piggybacked on nanoplastic particles, which we find everywhere in nature now, and barium, strontium, titanate, and fluoride um, that is raining down on us. Now, there must be proper, just, these are just normal passenger flights, right? Well, um, the Germans have a nice work for that. It's called Fluglinie. Linie is the shortest way from A to B. Is that what you see here? Is that the fluke linear? The pilot thought he was going, this is over Berlin, he thought was going uh, to Hamburg, that, but then realized, no, no, I'd rather go to uh, Zurich. Yeah? And this pilot here clearly kind of was confused. First he went this way, and then he went that way, and then he went that way. Is this commercial flights? I don't know. This is over San Francisco. Um, the waves, uh, the pattern in the clouds often indicates that somebody is playing frequencies off them. The strange weather cloud formations that we have. The sum total effect for us light practitioners is that we get, we have about 40% overall light, uh, light, less light now than we had 20 years ago. That's published. You know, that the overall light that we're getting is 40% uh, less and that the frequencies that we're getting are highly deficient. There is deficient things in there, and we can just use the Fraunhofer lines you know, for aluminum and figure out which color we are not getting. Um, and then uh, friends of us measured the aluminum levels in the rain. You know, the American EPA says, okay, this is the upper limit, 0.5 micrograms per liter air of aluminum 
if it gets any higher than that, we need to warn the population to stay indoors. But the levels that we got in the rain after spraying off the sky are exceeding. This is here 7,000 times over this level. This is 2,000 times over the level and so forth. And in Germany, it's really bad. Um, Austria is still a little bit better by degrees from what we hear. And here's a wonderful article published on this issue in a very good journal, the International Journal of Environmental Research. And again, uh, particulate sprayed by tanker jets for geoengineering, weather modification, and climate modification purposes. And then you know, down here, the consequences on public health are profound, including exposure to a variety of toxic heavy metals, radioactive elements, and neurologically implica implicated chemically mobile aluminum. And so, because we all have to breathe, there isn't anyone here in the room where I wouldn't find aluminum on the lungs. Um, the leading cancer in women, most people don't know that, but worldwide the leading cancer in women for the last four years is lung cancer, no longer breast cancer. And it's not true what our previous speaker said, at least not statistically, um, that cancer is the main cause of death. It's been taken over now by uh, death caused by neurological illness, Alzheimer's disease, MS, ALS, and so forth. And all the neurological illnesses are implied with metal toxicity and uh, glyphosate toxicity, not so much um, other things. So the solution, let there be light. Um, we all need more light than we're getting. And so I'm um, what I'm proposing uh, is the following. Um, the, the treatment with light um, has been around you know, for a long time. I mean, the Egyptians are using it, we're using it, and uh, throughout the cultures there were treatments using colored scarves or paintings even, like an artwork are, are modifying when we look at that, how we feel. Um, in the article um, that I wrote in the Syntonic Optometry Journal, I very much stressed the pathway. There's an offshoot from the retina, goes straight to, to the amygdala, and the memories that we have from our early childhood are all color-coded by letting the patient look at a certain color or putting color glasses on or uh, shining colored light on the patient. Those memories, those synapses will switch open and we get access to that. So, one of the main uses for color, and you heard a lot of lectures and will hear a lot of lectures, is in the realm of psychology. And in that area, it really doesn't matter how the light is generated, and some people have a cardboard box with just colored paper in front of it, and some use old slide projectors, so it doesn't matter. But if you want to do the medical treatment, if you want to do the photophoresis, if you want to do the teleportation of medicine into the patient, it does matter, you know? And I've tested at least, at least 20 or 25 different instruments from different teachers in the area, and the one that worked is the one based on the work of John Searfoss that Leona has, you know, with the narrowband filters and the holographic production of the light and the, the remedies placed against the, uh, in, into the light beam. That is what works if you want to use it that way. And I, I maybe I don't know. Do I have do I have two minutes? Not really. Well, I know. We, we could increase it if we uh, skip questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like questions. <laughs> um, I like to I like to do some PR here in July. I have an institute in England called Klinghardt Institute, and Daniela, who sits here in the front, is managing that. Daniela, would you show yourself? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and Daniela put on a workshop for one week in July where I teach my form of muscle testing and Leona's gonna be there teaching the color work where we bring those two things together and I also teach the psychological bit. So there's a week where you can learn the whole, where you can learn the whole thing. It's not something you just wanna go home and wing it, um, depends on what what method you're using, but the principle
holds also have an institute uh, in Germany called INK Institute for of Neurobiology, Klinghardt. And we have a whole course program. We have a very, very strong offshoot here in Vienna that's run by Ulrike, Ulrike show yourself, yeah. And Ulrike is pretty much the addressing the, the German speaking people here or people that potentially can learn in German. And uh, we do have this laser is a wonderful tool. Um, but again, it will take some training to actually know how to use it in fruitful ways. So you should first learn the uh, energetic testing technique that I use, autonomic response testing, and then it makes sense uh, to get these instruments. And once you have one of these instruments, you will fall in love with it, uh, the results that you're getting. Um, so I, I just wanted to distinguish that. You know, if you use color in the psychotherapeutic way, it really doesn't matter what the source of the color is, but if you use it in a medical way, it does matter how you piggyback information on the light. Okay, it was really nice with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.